the 13th annual St. Louis Fringe Festival and the 9th annual Tennessee Williams Festival. We'll preview both next on City Corner. I'm Steve Potter and welcome to City Corner. Coming up a little bit later, we're going to preview this year's St. Louis French Fest, but first it's the Tennessee Williams Festival and please welcome Carrie Houck. She's the executive artistic director and I guess the founder would be the right term. That's exactly correct. How did this all come <laughs> about, Carrie, for you to begin all of this? Well, I had recently moved back to St. Louis after commuting to and from Chicago for a number of years and I wanted a new endeavor and I had produced a, a production of a Tennessee Williams play in 2014 that was a big success called Stairs to the Roof. And the response was so strong that I was encouraged to form a board and create a St. Louis Tennessee Williams Festival. There is a longstanding one in New Orleans that's over 30 years old. There's one in Provincetown, Massachusetts that's approaching 20 years. And there are two in Mississippi honoring Williams. And, I, you know, frankly, I always wondered why we didn't have one here. For people that don't know, we kind of claim him. He was mm -hmm. uh, not born here, but moved here at an early age. And his father was an executive. Tell, tell me a little bit about his history here. Well, he moved here um, during a time when St. Louis was very polluted. <laughs> that I didn't even know about until right. I started the festival. You know, there was a lot of industry here and there was actually like black smoke everywhere. Right. And they lived in the city initially in the Central West End. Where we've actually done a production in their original uh, home. Wow. Outside of it on the fire escapes, we did the Glass Menagerie there in 2021. But... Um, his mother, Edwina, really wanted to integrate into St. Louis society, so they did gradually move west, not that far, but... Um, uh, One of the things, though, that we want people to know is uh, he grew up in St. Louis, yeah. and he is considered w one of the most famous, successful, talented playwrights that ever lived. Am I... You're not exaggerating, no. I mean, we, we consider him America's Shakespeare. Last night at our table reading of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, the director and I kept turning to each other like, even though we've both read the play and seen the play and he's directed the play twice, um, just marveling at the language. I mean, it's just magnificent. And I think the way he speaks to the human condition and the, the challenges of being maybe an other, not a cookie cutter type personality, um, I think really speaks to people and, and continues to, and I hope that that will continue. And it's one of the reasons I started the festival. And he presented things in his own unique way, which was not like everybody else did at the time. I almost thought it's kind of appropriate we're doing a piece on the French Fest next, because back when he was doing it in the beginning, wasn't he kind of on the fringe? He was. He was working with the Mummers, which were, they were a company of sort of socially active, um, fringy type folk, bohemian types in, who worked out of the Wednesday Club, which is what it was at the time on the corner of Taylor and Westminster, which was their neighborhood at the time. And, um, you know, they were an offbeat bunch and... He wrote for them and was part of the company, and I think it was one of the things that did make him happy here. And I don't know the answer to this. I'm curious. Was he as famous when he was alive as he is now? Oh, yeah. Oh, right, okay. I mean, after the Glass Menagerie, he was like a superstar. Uh -huh. But then the star dwindled. It faded later in his career. Um, you know, after his big, big hits, Streetcar and Night of the Iguana, it started dimming a bit as be he became a little edgier and a little more, um, his lifestyle, you know, was uh, creating a r slow deterioration. He partied too much? Well, he did. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I terms. really love some of his later work. Mm -hmm. And I don't think enough people know about his later work. And I'm hoping as we continue with the festival that we'll start integrating more of that into our programming. Okay, this year's festival runs August 8th through 18th, but yeah. you sort of do things through the year too, don't you? We do, we did a cabaret in May and, 
and we had a pool event recently um, to just you know have fun and raise awareness for the festival. And there's a there's a shot from your cabaret. Who's it that? It was so great, Amy Jo Jackson. It's uh, the second year we brought her in, and her her musical director Brian Nash is quite known in New York, and uh, she's a big hit here, and in New York she's a uh, 54 Below quite often. She had oh, wow. last last year a really cool sort of campy take on Williams, where she took Williams' dialogue and put it to Broadway show tunes. Oh boy, but that yeah. was neat. Uh, there are two shows in particular that we want to talk about today. Yeah. You mentioned Cat on a Hot Tin Roof already. Yeah, that's the one I've really been waiting to do. I wanted to wait till we had our, our strong legs under us and um, great audiences, and I've sort of been holding it in my back pocket. How would you summarize that? what that's about? Well, it's like... <laughs> Succession, circa 1958. It, 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 there's a, it's about a whole lot. I mean, it's about family dynamics and love and conflict. And um, it, it's, there's a lot more in the theatrical version than there is the cinematic version, which most of us know quite well. I haven't seen it in years. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember like laughing a lot during his stuff. Am I just forgetting? You're forgetting because honestly, we screened it last year at the High Point mm -hmm. as sort of a preview for what we were going to do this year. And you know, gosh, as a kid, I only knew Burl Ives as, you know, he sang ho, ho, ho. Right. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, he was a, a singer and entertainer and I did not remember that he was such a really good actor. Wow. I mean, really good and quite funny. And there is, you know, I think there's always humor in Williams plays. And I think you need to mine it because it's certainly there. Um, well, why don't you talk, uh, why don't you mention the director and the people that are in it and just uh, okay. give us some background. Well, we were lucky enough to get Michael Wilson to direct the play. I met him. He's got I, some Broadway credits. He's got Broadway credits and he's a known Tennessee Williams interpreter. He's also known for his work with Horton Foot plays. And um, gosh, he's worked with some of the great women of the theater, Cicely Tyson and Elizabeth Ashley and Olympia Dukakis. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've idolized Michael for years before I even started the festival. And I met him accidentally <laughs> right after I had formed the board. I was in Provincetown at their festival, staying at an iconic lodging on the pier called Captain Jack's Wharf, where Williams wrote part of Streetcar and the Glass Menagerie. And I was peering in the door of the Williams unit, and um, I was invited in. Do you want to come see that? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he said, hello, I'm Michael Wilson. And I almost passed out. <laughs> and you know, we exchanged cards, and we started keeping in touch. And he came here a few years ago with a show that Brian Bat did for us called Dear Mr. Williams, a one-man show. And Michael directed that. Wow. So we sort of started the conversation about him coming back to direct a full-length play for us. And we got him. I know. I think we've only just got a few minutes left. But uh, do you want to mention some of the cast? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's St. Louis' finest. We have Peter Mayer's Big Daddy, Carrie wow. Ely. His wife is Big Mama. Brian Slayton, who's just a brilliant actor, who's playing Brick. Kaya McKiernan, who is a former Webster University Conservatory grad, is playing Maggie and... Um, uh, Eric Dean White is Gooper, and a woman named Roxanne Wellington is May. So it's it's like a an all star lineup. We have Muni kids, and another little kid is the No Neck Monsters, and yeah. The, the other show we want to mention too is Life Upon the Wicked Stage. I don't know anything about that. Well, what we've done is we're stringing together three Williams one acts that have to do with the vaude vaudeville oh. and the Grand Center area then and now. And we're honoring Grand Center with this production. We're interweaving vaudeville song and dance in between the shows. And there's a um, recurring character in all three during a progression in her life. Julie Layton's playing Annabelle. And uh, we have Gary Wayne Barker and Julia Crump. I mean, it's just Brian Holfeld, who's directed for us quite often, mm. is directing that. That'll be at the Curtain Call Lounge. Cats at the Grandel. So we're really looking at Grand Center and we're, we're over the years and how it was a former booming theater district. And we're, you know, we're coming back to that once again. So how do these two shows work on the 8th through the 18th? Are, do they both play through that time period? Or yeah. How's it set up? 
They both played during that time period, and we've uh -huh. tried to jog the schedule so people could make a day of the Canada Hunt and Roof, the One X, going to our panels. We have scholars panels the first Saturday that are magnificent. What are those about? Well, they're about all sorts of things. One is on Grand Center, one is on CAT, one is on, you know, vaudeville. I mean, it's, it's a, a big array. It's all on our website. Um, we're doing a Grand Center walking tour with the history of what it was then. Well, you know, I worked in Grand Center for a while. And uh, I really appreciate it there. And I, I no, heard stories from like I mean, my parents and grandparents about what it was. There's huge lore there that you know we all should know about, and, and I think we're, we may reach that again one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's we have a, a Tennessee Williams open mic. Our I was first just going to ask you about that. Tell me about. We it. just added that. We're <laughs> it's going to be at the Curtain Call Lounge, which is a really sweet little nightclub that's attached to the Fox. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. And uh, Bob Harvey's hosting, and Brian Holfield's going to play the piano. And you can bring a monologue, a poem, w by Williams or Tennessee Williams inspired. We're inviting song. We'll have the accompaniment. And uh, if you don't have a piece that you want to do, we're going to provide. We have some that we'll pass out, and anything goes. Anything it's, else? That one's free. And I'll Anything else public. during the festival happening? Uh, I think that might be it. We just keep, you know, we have eight performances each of Cat and Life Upon the Wicked Stage, the panels, the open mic, and uh, the walking tour. We've just got a we've just got a minute left, Carrie. What would give me a little insight into Tennessee Williams? Was he just your average guy? Did he have problems? I don't mean necessarily bad. I don't oh. know. He was a genius. Yeah, definitely a genius. Um, I think a very um, sensitive human being. And you know, the thing that drew me to Williams when I was very young, because I started reading his plays when I was really a kid, and the fact that he spoke to people who weren't um, the average type, you know, the, the popular kids. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was considered sort of outside of that loop. And you know, that can be lonely, and I think that he, he, he understands that pathos and reaches out to people um, who are experiencing the same thing. And, you know, I think that he understands that we can all be connected and find love and et cetera. And yes, he had a problem with um, living life pretty hard, but- So he was a human being. He was a human being. Well, I had the honor of meeting him once and spending an did. evening with him. Yeah, and that was huge. I wish we had more time so you could tell me Next about that. Time. That must have been Next something. Year. <laughs> it was. Well, well, congratulations on another year, and Thank it keeps you. getting better. That's my impression. It does. I'm really right. proud of it. Thank you, Steve. We've got some information we'll put up on the screen about the festival. It runs uh, August 8th through 18th in the uh, Grand Center area, and there's contact information. People can look it up and buy tickets ahead of time, right? Yep, everything's on the website. Have right, you ever been to the French Fest? I have. I have. Sadly, we're all at the same time. Last <laughs> year, I was a little later, but August works better for well, us. Well, they're next, and we're going to I know. take a look we at that. We wish each other well. Carrie, it's great to see you. Thanks for Thank being you, here. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. And we'll be back with more after this. graduate, they graduate. The 911, where is your emergency? I I'm Steve Potter, welcome back to City Corner. And uh, we're going to address now the upcoming St. Louis Fringe Festival. And first I'll introduce Deuce Matthew Kearns, who is their president and artistic director. Matthew, good to see you. Hi. And we've brought along a couple of people that we'll find out more about later, but that's Annalisa Coker and Brianna Jackson, who are both involved in some of the shows and we'll get into depth. But uh, 13th Fringe Fest, and what an idea for people that don't know, it's a whole bunch of different things and it's called fringe because what you do sometimes is kind of on the fringe. 
So we're multidisciplinary, which means that there are all forms of performance and visual art involved. And we come from, I say our grandfather is the Edinburgh uh, Fringe Festival. And if you remember almost, almost 80 years ago now, there were a group of artists that came to that theater festival in Edinburgh and they were told their work wasn't good enough, it wasn't strong enough, and they were asked to leave. So they went to the fringe of that festival and decided to create the first fringe ever that was uncurated, unjuried, and you could have any kind of expression you wanted and it would be celebrated. And for people that haven't been, you know, it's not like uh, going to the Fox and seeing a show, which is nothing wrong with that. This isn't like your typical, typical kind of theater event. And why don't you two just jump in? How, how do you guys describe the Fringe Festival to someone that doesn't know anything about it? I think it's, you know, it's a fun place for like all different kinds of creatives to kind of get together and like uh, work as one. Um, I got to see last year so many different, like a circus show, something that you just wouldn't expect you see at the Fringe Festival. Uh, and, you know, shows like The Fox and stuff, it's very family friendly, which is great. But like what's awesome about Fringe Festival is that there's so much unique and out there and controversial stuff that you get to like go and see, which is really cool. What about you? It is just a creative smattering mm -hmm. of everything and i love it because there are a lot of things i wouldn't necessarily see like dance maybe it's great dance is cool but i don't seek it out the rest of the year mm -hmm. i make sure to see something cool mm -hmm. that i wouldn't otherwise at fringe yeah. which i love and, and am i right in saying it's unlike another play where you go and you see a play for an hour and a half some of these could be short and split up and just it's like if you put it in a shaker so some of them are short and some of them are, you walk in, you walk out. It just depends on what the artist has created. And we've learned in our 13 years that if we have a headline series, a lot of people will come down and check out those shows and they'll stay for at least three to five other shows and try things that they never expected, things they've never heard of. And we're growing those audiences for those emerging artists. Well, Matthew, when you started this, um, I'm not sure you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think you kind of modeled it um, over other festivals, right? So, so what was that like in the beginning and it, did it take a while to figure it out? So my predecessor started it um, back in the way, back in 2011 and they, it was a very grassroots effort. There were a couple of shows and by the time I got there in year five is when I took over, we had decided we needed to look at every festival in the country and see what worked best for us and we created a hybrid model. So that means that we have headline acts, we have an invited artist series and everybody else comes out of the St. Louis stage, which is our lot straight out of the fishbowl. Now, somebody said something that's not like your family-friendly show. Uh, how, how do you want to address that? Is it like for adults only or what kind of perimeters do you put on? Fringe is for everyone. So we have we have a young artist show and we've got several other shows in the, in the festival this year that are also uh, for everybody. And there are also things like burlesque and things that are more adult for people to see and we run the gamut. And the greatest thing about it is we always ask the artists to give us a rating for their work. We don't wanna rate it, we ask them to do it. And we ask them to do it to help our patrons choose what's right for them and their people they're coming with. And they graciously do it so you can look right straight at uh, every piece, of the, piece on the lineup and you can see exactly what's family friendly and what's more adult. Okay, now you two, uh, besides being in the festival this year, you've done it before. So. Um, Annalisa, let me begin with you. What's your history with it? And then tell me what you're doing this year. Sure. So I have done it uh, multiple years. I've done four plays. And then I also did improv uh, before that. So I love it. And it's been a really cool thing because I always wanted to do something beyond just regular comedy. And Fringe allowed me to do that. And now it's something that I'm passionate about that I always dreamed of doing, and I'm doing it. Yeah. Oh, like, cool. Oh, that's so it's like exciting. Like, oh, that is so exciting. Are you doing it right dreams. now? <laughs> I am still doing it. Um, yeah, so this is actually uh, Ignite's second year at Fringe Festival. Ignite La Theater Company. Let's yes, be Ignite. Clear. Yeah, sorry. Ignite Theater Company. Uh, last year, I really wanted to do a 24 hour play festival, and it's kind of. Uh, it's a little crazy. We did a lock-in at our theater space. We were there for 24 hours and yeah, we put on a whole show. Uh, we did actually four shows, uh, kind of like improv style. They kind of knew where they were going, uh, pl plot wise, but yeah, it was so fun and something the kids had never, ever done before. So we like to thank Fringe for that. So Annalisa, what are you doing this year? 
I am doing a show with my artistic partner, Paniyoti Papavlasopoulos. We'll call him Pete because that's easier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Pete. Pete, he and I have co-written a play that we're also acting in. It's directed by Eric Diaz and it's called Fella and Dame, an ode to mid-century comedy and St. Louis's Gaslight Square. Well, yeah, because this looks like a, a 1960s black and white movie or fit yes. 1950s black and white movie. That's actually, um, we recreated a picture of Elaine May and Mike Nichols. So that's one of their album covers that they did. That's why it looks familiar. There you go. Mm -hmm. So what's it about? It is about two fic uh, fictional comedians, a, a comedy duo, Stella Fella and Danny Dame. They are based on um, comedians of the time. So what's really neat is that in Gaslight Square, there were a ton of comedians, right. including something called the Compass Players. I don't know if you're familiar with them. I'm very familiar with them. They were the first ever long form improv group in the country. We love improv. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and so we are playing these characters as if you walk into the theater, you're seeing their live show. You're watching Fella and Dame. There's an overarching story. But we are reprising sketches of Nichols and May oh. and Stiller and Mira, who were both in the Compass Players. So I think that's really cool because you see musicians cover songs mm -hmm. all the time, yeah. but you never see comedy being revisited. And I, I just want to give new life to it and have a new audience see these things. So. And that's exactly that's so cool. what Fringe is for, to experiment, to try new things, to take old things and make them new again. That's exactly why uh, an organization like the National Endowment for the Arts gave us a commendation last year uh, as being one of the top 25 most excellent art organizations in the state. How do you, just, how do you describe the show that uh, Brianna is doing? I mean, uh, excuse me, Annalicia. <laughs> Me, I call it a revisiting of Gaslight Square, which is my favorite because St. Louis loves its history. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it's such an integral part of our history, Gaslight Square, and everything that happened down there. Brianna, now Hi. tell me about your show this year. Yes, so uh, we are doing You're in Town the Musical. Um, and actually a little fun backstory on You're in Town. It actually was produced for the first time at the International Fringe Festival in New York City in 1999. And then it was so well received by its audiences that it went on to go on Broadway and debut in 2001. Um, but yeah, our story is kind of like your typical musical with like a little twist. Uh, boy. I was going to say your own town can't be typical. Yeah, no. And the name is very silly. But uh, yes, it is in fact about P. Um, <laughs> so the story goes, boy meets girl. Girl turns out to be the evil guy's daughter. They fall in love, start a revolution. They don't quite get their happy ending, though. Uh, and what I love about You're in Town so much is that it's written as like a satire and a love letter to musical theater. So there's so much like parodies happening with the style, the structure, the storytelling. Um, and we've kind of really leaned into that with our production. We have taken inspiration from Three Penny Opera, Les Mis, a little bit of Chicago, uh, West Side Story. So what I love and the fact that we get to do this at Fringe is we're going to have so many creative people that are like-minded and they all kind of understand what these parodies are coming, where they're coming from. So uh, yeah, it's going to be a little different audience than like what we're used to at Ignite. So I'm excited. Matthew, how do you analyze that show? How do I analyze it? Maybe oh that's the wrong word. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if I, how I analyze it, but I'm thrilled that it's here. Yeah. And I love any kind of social commentary yeah. and things that make us think about social norms and what we do with social normatives in society today. Mm -hmm. I think we've just got a couple of minutes left, but uh, you guys as actors and stuff, you, do you guys get to participate in seeing, all, are you too busy to see all the shows or? Or, oh. or do you experience the whole thing too? No, I, I mean, I went and saw shows last year uh, in between what we were doing, uh, and I plan to this year. Uh, I'm really excited to see Big Machine. I have some yeah. friends. My choreographer is also in that show, uh, Jordan Woods. Uh, but yeah, so I plan on going and seeing. It's it, it's really cool how it's set up because you really do get some time to kind of like go and sneak away and see these other shows. So. Alicia, what about you? Oh, I was a 
patron of the Fringe Festival before I was a performer, and I am hungry for it. I am not letting <laughs> being in the festival affect my ability to go to the festival. Yeah. So I, I try to drink up as much as I can. And Matthew, I'm not sure if you, you mentioned this before, but you've got so many people. Are they all super local? Do they come from far away? What's the deal? It's all of the above. We have a very large contingent that are local and regional. And then we also have people on the national circuit that come by and they drop in. And some of those you'll see early in the week because they're leaving one festival um, from one state. They're dropping into us to do a show and then they're going on to Indianapolis for the weekend. And it's like, I think we mentioned this, over 40? Over 40 acts. Over 40 acts. We have ticketed events and free events and you can be on the campus and you can be around all day and you'll see something and many things. You'll see so much. And you're performing at different venues. We are. We're at the Dotsack Theater. We are at uh, the High Low. We are at the Marcel Theater. Uh, and then we also have events at the Urban Chestnut Brewery. Uh -huh. What is there anything that you haven't mentioned that's going on that we, we should know about? Well, they mentioned Big Machine. That's the Fly North musical about uh, the great machine, which is the automobile. We meant, uh, and then there's Broken Bone Bathtub, the documentary. Siobhan O'Laughlin is coming back, our National Artist of the Year. And she's coming back with a story, the documentary about being on the road as a solo performance artist from when she did this show that we debuted here in 2016, uh, where she broke her wrist, she borrowed people's bathtubs, and she created a play about it and took that play all over the world. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's actually how I wound up doing my play, is Paniotti saw that show, was like, Annalisa should do a one-woman show. I'm submitting her. Yeah. And the, the rest... So that's history. That, yeah. <laughs> and so that's I'm, what I love. It's so many artists have gone through the fringe. So many people met each other and formed companies. Mm -hmm. A lot of the companies that you know, they've touched the fringe um, and they've been a part of it. And I would think for the typical actor, if there's such a thing that maybe does traditional shows, this would be kind of fun for them to do something different. What do we need to know about tickets? We've got some information we can show, but what yes. do people need to know ahead of time? Uh, stlfringe.org, you can get schedules, you can get show times, uh, you can get tickets, and all the information is right there, stlfringe.org, and festival passes. And you've kind of referred to it, but why is this so much fun? What is, what did we say that wasn't fun, right now, Steve? Yeah, I mean, you could spend all day there. I mean, for real. There's stuff going on in the mornings all the way to late nights. So an artist a few years ago said, this is like summer camp for the arts. Yes, that's and so perfect. And I've always yeah. kind of stuck that in my mind, and it feels that way. There's a spirit at the fringe that's so exciting, mm -hmm. and there's a thought-provoking, like, just men, like, group thing together that we're all thinking about how art is getting created, and the boundaries that we're pushing throughout. And it. do you sort of feel like um, like it catches more fire every year? Every year, yeah. every year. We had a 90% uh, uptick in applications of people wanting to be in the festival this year. No kidding. Yeah. And that's not just locally. That's not just locally. That's that's locally, regionally, and globally. And really, we just had to turn some people away because we didn't have space. Well, get on the fringe is what I have to yeah, say. Yeah, get right? to the fringe. Yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. Have another great season. And, Thank you. And we love creativity here in St. Louis, that's for sure. It's the St. Louis Fringe Fest. Check it out. I'm Steve Potter. Thanks for watching City Corner and join us next time.